Welcome to Food Addiction 102. I am your host, Tosca Lindberg. Uh, we are going to continue what we learned from Food Addiction 101. And if you have not seen Food Addiction 101, we'll get you a link to that. Um, you can take a look at it, but I'm going to do a bit of a review. So here's the overview of what we're going to walk through today. And hopefully it doesn't take, a, it might take a bit more than an hour and I'll do a Q and A at the end. Um, I will try to manage, I know um, I have, I only have one screen here. So I've got the PowerPoint, I've got you guys. And so if people are chatting, I might not be able to see it. So save your questions, I'll go or put them up in the chat and I'll run through the chat later. Um, so we'll have time for questions. We'll be able to do that, okay? So, uh, we're going to go over, I'm going to share my story a little bit. Um, we are going to review the problem a bit from Food Addiction 101, and we're going to talk about what recovery looks like, what it doesn't, and how to pull it off, okay? We're going to talk about both physical and emotional sobriety. All right, so jumping in, my story, I'll just share briefly, um, my story had uh, I am a food addict and I've I've been in recovery now for four years and I'm um I was a math teacher before this and I've I've jumped on to Schiff's team. I've been trained with to be a food addiction counselor through the Infact school and I am happily pursuing um education in food addiction and uh it's it's been so life altering for me but you can see from some of my younger pictures i i did not struggle with obesity as a young kid um into college i'm very tall if you can never know that on zoom but um i played basketball i was thin i was active and yet i knew that there was something different about um about me there was something different I noticed that other people could eat, uh, you know, they, they, other people just weren't as interested in candy. I could not imagine, I went to somebody's house and they just had a bowl of candy sitting there on the shelf. And I was like, what is that? Oh, it's just always, it's always there. Like all I could think about was that candy. And I just realized, wow, people play and do things without having candy? And without focusing on eating it. So I started recognizing that. And um, I, by the time I was in college, I called myself a sugaraholic. And I used to joke and say, they ought to have a 12 step program for sugaraholics. And uh, I did not know that they did. Um, and anyways, I my weight did not catch up with me. But one thing that was very, very true for me was I was I was very depressed. And I actually have, we'll talk a little later when we talk about emotional sobriety. You can see that I, even though I wasn't obese, the symptom didn't get me, that I struggled with depression. I was even suicidal. I was, um, you know, miserable. I was miserable in my skin, lack of boundaries, codependency, all of that. And I was eating, but getting away with it. As you can see, it caught up to me in my in my 40s. I was up to 270. That was my high. And there you've got my before and after picture where I've lost um, down 110 pounds and have just been easily just coasting along at that weight. I'm just, I have this contented sobriety that I really want to pass along to everybody. Um, that's the gift that I've been given and I want to share it. So there, that last picture of me with these circles over here, can you see my little mouse moving around when I move it? Okay, yeah. So this picture right here, I'm t I'm actually teaching about 12-step recovery and, and food addiction. And um, uh, it's just been a beautiful journey. So, all right, jumping in. We're starting off with talking about food addiction. But we really need to kind of untangle the fact that there are other types of problem eaters. And the message that gets mixed by all these different types of, um, of eaters, it, it's so confusing. It's not as simple as like alcohol or drugs where it's just, um, I, you know, I started, I, I'm an alcoholic, so I just don't 
drink alcohol. That's so simple. It's just so simple. But with food, there's like a lot of different types of uh, mix of eating disorders or disordered eating. And we really need to take a look at if we are indeed a food addict. And I'm leaving this hanging up here for a minute and you can look back at it with the recording, but we're not gonna go into it too much. But if you're not sure that you're an actual food addict with a substance use disorder, we have a, a Yale scale for food addiction that you can take online and it's totally free. And I'll put the link in to the notes as well. Um, if you're watching the recording, it'll be down in the description. Description, So you, you can actually take an assessment that the scientists use that's been scientifically validated to show if you have what we call a substance use disorder with food. And that's when we get, when we, we that's what I'm going to be talking about is how to treat that and treat well, a lot of us. If we have substance use disorder, we get lumped into this category with eating disorders and the treatments for eating disorders, which involve like eating in moderation or intuitive eating. And these kinds of things just don't work when you have a physiological reaction. And I'll talk more about that. So just being specific that we're talking about food addicts from here on down. Okay, we're not talking about emotional eating. We're not talking about eating disorders. We're talking about a substance use disorder. So this will be a bit of a review from Food Addiction 101. And this is a big slide, so I gotta scoot you guys over. Um, our disease has two components to it, the physical component and a mental component. And we're gonna start on the physical side with eating something, okay? so. If I ingest something that's a trigger food for me, um, we call this like playing Russian roulette. Uh, we could have one of two reactions. We could have a normal reaction where we don't actually go spiral into a binge, or we could have this abnormal reaction. And we say that this disease progresses, and, and some people have it more severely than others. As in Russian roulette is a dangerous game. They usually put one bullet in, but like as we, as our disease progresses, it's like there's more and more bullets in these chambers. Like I'm just gonna have an abnormal reaction. And what is an abnormal reaction for a food addict? We develop a physical craving. So I noticed early in, I could not have any peanut M&Ms, but if I had one, I was gonna keep eating them for the rest, you know, until I was in basically in a binge. So I was going to binge. And that happens inside of our brains. And I'll talk about the science of that later. And we just have a heart, we can get stuck right here in the binge cycle. But eventually we have what we call the national anthem, where we actually, we just call it the national anthem because all addicts get to these points where we're like, I'm not going to do it anymore. I swear I'm going to break it. You know, like I'm starting this new diet and I'm gonna exercise and pull myself together and we actually break out of this binge cycle for a minute. Um, but then what happens is life, life happens. And we are restless, irritable and discontent. Whether we had a normal reaction or not, we're, we're back in life. And as life happens, uh, we have this thing we call the emotional barometer. Now we're coming over to the mental, emotional side of this disease. And this is the trickiest side because this emotional barometer is supposed to um, be able to handle our emotions, but as, and, and, and when, it, when it's cool, we can use willpower to block us off from this idea that we should use. And I'm talking about drugs, alcohol, anything, but right now specifically food, we've got to use something as our solution because we feel miserable. But when, when our emotional barometer gets up to the boiling point, we develop these things called mental obsessions. And it's just like these crazy ideas. Like I could probably have one more, you know, I could probably start on Monday. I'll start fresh. It's been a long day. It's been a hard day. And I've heard as crazy of obsessions as I'm on an airplane. It doesn't count when I'm on an airplane. I mean, that's just such a crazy idea, but I've heard it for more than one person now. So the problem is once we get this mental obsession and then we just absolutely are powerless over using as a solution and then boop, we're back over into the physical side, trapped. And we call this the roundabout, okay? And we find that our disease, that we are powerless 
in two spots on this roundabout. We're powerless over our reaction to the food when we ingest it. We don't know what's going to happen. And for most of us, it's going to be a bang day. And then we are powerless over these mental obsessions. So we actually need two solutions. We need a solution for the physical side. And this is what I'm really going to get into today. I'm going to talk about the abstinent food plan that that keeps us free from this whole triggered cycle. And then I'm going to talk about emotional sobriety. Okay. We've got to do something about this emotional barometer because even though we escape from it physically, we turn back to it and people will just talk about relapsing. I'm relapsing. And that's what happens when our emotional barometer gets out of control. Okay. So before we jump into the solution part, I do want to point out that addiction as a disease has many symptoms. It can affect us and our physical health. I mean, that's obvious for those of us who struggle with food addiction, that our physical health is impacted. Um, our mental health is so impacted by addiction. I was so depressed um, for so many years. We have We can have financial impact both from just spending money on binge foods, but we can also have like shopping addiction. Um, yard sales call my name quite frequently. <laughs> we have, I can't even see what this is because there's stuff on top of it. There we go. We can have work problems. Um, we can have work addiction. We can also just have trouble functioning at work and have really poor boundaries. Poor boundaries can affect us in all kinds of ways. We can have spiritual problems. We are unhappy with ourselves spiritually. And I can really, this really was a painful spot for me in my addiction. Um, I wasn't who I wanted to be and I did not feel accepted and loved and um, yeah, really broken in this area. We can have legal trouble, although this kind of goes for more for drug and alcohol addiction because it's currently still legal to eat and drive. But, um, you know, many of us have stolen food. I know I did. Um, relationships, we have issues in our relationships. We're lying, we're hiding, we're isolating. We also have lack of boundaries. Many of us are very codependent and in um, relationships that really aren't balanced at all. So, and then I, I left this one for actual substance abuse because a lot of us really think that the substance abuse is the addiction. The substance abuse is a symptom of the deeper addiction, okay? So we've looked at the symptoms and one thing we really wanna make sure, the symptoms actually bring us a lot of pain in our lives and we have to be careful that we're not treating the symptoms. This goes with any disease, right? Like we're always like, I have a cold, I feel miserable. I don't wanna feel miserable. I'm gonna take this medicine, but then we still have to rest and like let ourselves heal instead of just keep going. And that's what we tend to do with addiction is we, um, we want to just uh, treat the symptoms and not actually deal with the addiction. And that's a, that's a deadly, that does not work for us because it's like whack-a-mole. You get one of these symptoms to come down and another one pops out. And that's because the, the root of this problem is not being dealt with, okay? So this is all review from Food Addiction 101. And now we're gonna start talking about the new material, what recovery looks like, and I'm gonna talk about what it doesn't look like as well. Okay, first of all, food freedom, as opposed to white knuckling. We call it white knuckling when we're like, okay, I'm doing it. I haven't eaten flour and sugar, but I am miserable and I am craving all the time. And I, you know, this is white knuckling. Food freedom feels different, okay? Food freedom, what does food freedom feel like? Um, it feels like my palate has changed. I, I thought before that things were, would taste yucky without sugar in them, you know, and I couldn't even taste the natural sweets that are in vegetables and fruits and things. So our palate actually adjusts. We really can settle into food just being our fuel. 
instead of being something that I'm looking for comfort, looking to for comfort. I'm rarely hungry. I don't have any cravings, which is crazy. Um, I can sit next to people that are eating, you know, NMF. NMF is, stands for not my food. I can sit next to people eating NMF and, um, you know, I can even smell it. I can cut and serve up a birthday cake and it does not pull me. So if you're in food freedom, it's easy to say no. Okay. And there is a way to get there. So if you've tried and you, you know, you hear, um, quit sugar, sugar is addictive and people quit sugar, but they're not actually making it to food freedom because maybe they're still in a triggered state or, you know, maybe there's the emotional barometer, but white knuckling is, is feels more like this fighting cravings, obsessing about food, feeling deprived. Um, that is where a lot of people, you're not going to last if you're just feeling like, oh, I'm deprived and, and focus, the focus on diet and on food. And it, and it's hard to be around people eating NMF when you're white knuckling it. So that's what food freedom feels like. And if you're not having that, then there's something more for you in recovery. Like there's a deeper recovery for you. Um, back to this list, we have contented surprise uh, sobriety as opposed to wanting to be normal contented sobriety and so i'm talking about not feeling restricted or deprived just accepting um that i have that i need this food plan and that i i can live normally as on this food plan but i don't have this big desire to be a normal person and get back to, you know, when will I be able to go back? You know, if I've lost all my weight, why can't I go back to eating, you know, cookies and ice cream and things? Um, but I'm also talking about emotional sobriety and being contented to actually feel my emotions as they arise and pay attention to them and not category not uh bury or numb myself from emotions so i'm talking about both physical and emotional sobriety and uh one day at a time mentality is something that you really see in in uh people that have long-term recovery it's just it's just, uh, I have a friend in, in my 12-step group and I'm like, I get spun off. Oh, what about this? And what about that? And he'll say, I don't know, Tosca, it's Tuesday. And I'm just like, oh, right, 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 right. I'm spun off into the future and I want to have everything under control. And um, I don't know if you've noticed that a lot of us who, you know, I don't know if that's you, like just, I need to know. I need, I, we just got done working with a group of people at the intensive and uh, one of them was just desperate to know the weather. What's the weather going to be tomorrow? What's the weather? And it's like, yeah, just let it come, let it come, you know, one day at a time. And so we really, we can really settle into just being where we are and accepting reality as it is when we're in recovery and it feels so much different it's so different to me and i'm you know my four-year sobriety birthday was yesterday guys um so i've got four years and so i'm still kind of a baby around with you know there are many people i know that have you know 10 20 years amanda's got about 10 and uh, esther's got over 20 and uh you know, I'm still a baby and I'm just, you know, but the difference between how my life felt before and how my life feels now, it's not the weight. I lost 110 pounds. I don't even care. Like I, it's great. It's nice. Yeah. It's great. But the, I was so full of shame and self-hatred and, um, this has changed so much and learning how to live one day at a time. It's just very, very beautiful. So um, how do we pull this off is the question. And we're gonna talk about stop treating the symptoms and treating addiction, okay? And it's really important that we focus in here because 
oh my gosh, do these symptoms bring us pain? And that's all we can think about is getting rid of these symptoms, but it's not going to work. Not long-term. It's going to be whack-a-mole unless you treat the actual addiction. All right. So we're going to start talking about treating the addiction and we're going to start with the food piece. Um, the food is important and the food needs to come first, but it's not everything. All right. First of all, let's talk for a minute about the science of food addiction. We have a couple issues with the food. I'm just specifically talking about food now. Um, we have a couple issues that we have to deal with as addicts. One is cravings. Um, cravings, uh, when we have a, the brain of an addict, our brains release more dopamine than a normal person's brain does when triggered. They can see this on brain scans. This is scientifically established. And this, by the way, goes for alcohol, drugs, and all kinds. All, this is addiction right here. This is the dopamine reward cycle. It gets hijacked in an addict. Our receptors in our brain thin out, downregulate, because there's so much dopamine flooding all the time as we abuse our drug. And we are driven to continue using our substance just to feel normal. So we're just trying to feel normal. Without it, we feel miserable because of the, and this is tolerance is what's happening when we when we have dopamine receptors thinning out. How it feels in our heads is I need whatever food to be okay. Like I just need this, I just need that. And if you're a food addict, you know what I'm talking about. Like, ah, what's gonna hit the spot? This is what we're talking about with cravings. Um, we also have to deal with, and this is something that um, other addictions do not have to deal with, is like we have to eat. We can't just stop eating. So we deal with hunger. Um, the hunger hormones, are, leptin is, is the hormone that actually tells us when we've had enough food. And normally our brain can see that when we eat, it gets in our bloodstream and our brain sees it. Um, and that tells us to get up and move and stop eating. But in the food addict, the brain cannot see the leptin because we've had too much sugar, we've got too much insulin reacting to that, and it actually blocks the leptin receptor. So how that feels in our brain is, I am starving to death, okay? And I'm actually going to stop sharing for a second because I'm just going to tell you guys a story of... Uh, can't quite see you how I want to see you. There you are. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a story about uh, how it feels in our brains. And that is there, there was a um, there was a psychologist who wanted to study the or not, probably not. Yeah, I think he was a psychologist wanted to study his brain, but he he wanted to do something that you can never ask anybody to do. So he had his assistant do it to him, cut his brain open and and find the little electrode in there that you could zap and it would make him point his toe. Okay, so he's he's got his he's got his assistant there and he's saying, okay, make me point my toe. And it would it would point his toe. And so he's like, okay, now he's like, I will think I am not gonna point my toe. I'm gonna keep my toe flexed. And on the count of three, you zap me with that thing. So one, two, three, you know, and he gets the zap. He's trying so hard not to do it. Boom, his toe, his toe points, of course, right? Like he's getting zapped in the brain. And he's like, do it again, do it again. He's getting, he's freaking out. And the reason he was freaking out was because what happened in his brain, what he experienced as he gets this little electrode and he's thinking his hardest, I'm not going to point my toe, is it felt like he changed his mind. He changed his mind. Like in his brain, that's how, that's what it, he experienced. So he was like, no, I'm not going to. And then all of a sudden, oh, I feel like I should, I should point my toe right now. What that shows is what we experience is a changing of our mind. Have you guys ever changed your minds? Have you said, I'm going to do this diet and I'm going to eat this way. And then all of a sudden at like, four o'clock in the day, you know, later in the day, you're like, yeah, I think I'd rather, you know, you got the healthy veggies in the fridge, you really planned it out, it's all prepared for you. And all of a sudden, you're changing your mind and you're having whatever. 
And then what do we do with ourselves after that happens? We feel like I'm a miserable person. I can't even stick to anything. I should, and we get full of shame and self hatred. And I lived my life in this state. Okay. And it felt like I was such a loser. But what's happening is our brains are hijacked. Our, my brain thought I was starving to death because of all the sugar that was on board, because the leptin couldn't be seen by my brain. My brain was literally hijacked, just like that electro, electrode thing poking into the guy's brain and making him point his toe. My brain was that hijacked. It feels like we're changing our minds, but we're not. We're just, we just have a hijacked brain. So we really have to think when we have a brain like this, and I'm going to jump back into this. When we have a, this one, okay. When we have a brain like this, we feel these th bottom lines. I need something to be okay. I'm starving to death. And it's just a hijacked brain. It's not that we're bad people. This is not a moral issue. It's a disease. Okay. I mean, that is some really deep stuff. If you haven't really thought about that yet and if you're carrying a load of shame over what what your life has you know how your life has gone and how you've done with diets really think about this it is not your fault it's a hijacked brain and you have a disease and there is hope there is recovery i'm sitting here today telling you um let's jump into not going anywhere Let's jump into the next slide. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides, the slippery slope. Um, this is what makes food, food is harder than drugs and alcohol, and this is why. We have to eat, we have to eat enough. And people say, you know, if you're, if we, we have this thing, don't get on the slippery slope. Addictive eating is down here in this corner right here. And what we have are maybe spots on this slope, and it, it might be different for everybody, but if you eat flour or sugar, you're going to slide right down there. That's what I'm saying. If I have one bite of flour or sugar, I'm going to slide down in there. Sweeteners get a lot of people. I do know some people who can have sweeteners and they're okay, but a lot of people are triggered by sweeteners and they just slide down into the ditch. BLT stands for bites, licks, and tastes. So while you're cooking, do you lick the spoon? Believe it or not, that's a slippery slope for us. We could slide right down. Nuts might be, and these are examples at this point. Nuts, coffee can trigger people. I've got an avocado on there. Can trigger people. It's too, it's too much for some people. It it can slide you down. Now, a normal person is like this four-wheel drive truck. They can go binge and drive right back up and get on this comfortable road and just be going along. But we're not normal. And, and those of us, if we're an early stage food addict, we might be able to kind of fight our way up this slope, but it's hard. It's hard to hang out on the side of this slope, eating things that trigger you. I don't consider myself an early stage food addict. I'm a late stage food addict and I need, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair. I kind of visualize myself as being in a wheelchair and I need to be on this road, the safe road where if I can eat on this and this is what food freedom is. I have a guardrail. I have a guard, I have a food plan and I have a sponsor that I'm accountable to. And I have a food commitment that I make each day. I'm going to eat this, this, and this. Okay. And that keeps me off of this slippery slope. Um, on the other side of this, I have, I have a scale because my scale actually keeps me from being too restrictive. We can get too restrictive too, right? Like that's the other side of this thing is we can say, oh, I'm not, you know, and this is where our diets are and fasting. And sometimes I even like to put keto up there because um, it's restrictive and it's, uh, categories okay like I eat fruits and and like I eat all the things fruits vegetables protein fat and grains um, and I can stay on this road not that everybody can eat all of those things but this is a safe road for me this is the road to food freedom and I can just stay on this road and stay in these guardrails and this is how I get food freedom there's a lot of peace right here for me um 
I've got this little guy here sliding up and down. If you if you're hanging out here in early stage, you you slide up and down this. It's not a fun place to be. Eventually you will fall down into addictive eating. And it's just not it's not peaceful. It's white knuckling. That's white knuckling right there. Um I'm just at peace on mine. Oh, I guess that was the end of that slide. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about the trap of diet mentality. Um because oh my gosh we have tried so hard to be to to deal with this we have spent our lives trying to deal with this and so we just have this deep belief that if i can just lose the weight i'll be okay all right we have that very deep belief and a lot of times as people are losing weight they're getting like a high from that like i'm doing it i'm doing it and it's very exciting but I don't know if any of you have experienced this, getting down to the weight that you want. And life is still life. There's still pain, right? And all of a sudden, the thrill of losing the weight is over. And then you rebound back up. And, you know, so many of us food addicts do this up and down hundreds of pounds. I just was at the intensive with a guy who said he's, he's lost 1,250 pounds in diets in his life up and down up and down and we're not it's not about losing weight remember that's a symptom of our disease that's not the disease and if you think you're just going to lose the weight and be okay you're going to find out that that's not the case and then you'll be disappointed so we really got to get out of diet mentality um one of the things that people say in program is if you focus on the um, if you focus on the weight, if you focus on your recovery, you'll lose the weight. If you focus on the weight, you'll lose your recovery. Okay, so we really just want to focus on recovery. The weight resolves by itself. When we can stay on a, on a uh, food plan, we stay on that road, that food neutrality, food freedom road, the weight resolves itself. But we're not focused on the weight. Um, we also have this, a lot of people struggle with this. If I can just get on the perfect food plan, everything will be fine. Um, I'm talking about people who are just really focused on, and they might totally know that sugar is addictive and I need to not eat sugar and I need to not eat this and I need to not eat that. And this is when we get into emotional sobriety, right? The other side of the disease. If we're just focused on the physical, it doesn't solve our problem. We find ourselves relapsing. So a lot of times people, people's food plans will be like, you know, this or that. I have, I have, um, you know, I can have avocados. I can't have avocados. Fruits don't work for me. I don't have grains and things get narrower and narrower as they find themselves binging on this food and that food, you know, and like, and that's because they're not dealing with the emotional part of the disease. They're just focused on the food. And if you're not dealing with the emotional sobriety, yeah, you're going to binge, even if it's on a piece of fruit, even if it's on some oatmeal, even if it's on an avocado, you know? So instead of just narrowing down your food plan, we've got to actually focus on the emotional sobriety. Um, that is the heart of what we need to do. So just think about your food plan. If you've been tweaking it and tweaking it and narrowing it and narrowing it, and you're still white knuckling, it's not the food. It's not the food. It's the emotional sobriety. Okay. Um, here, this one is kind of subtle and I, I can feel this one. I just, I mean, really emotion addiction is just this restless, irritable discontent. I don't want to feel my own emotions properly. I don't, you know, like this is just, um, you know, it's all about the, the inner stuff. And when I want to be fixed, I want to be perfect. Now I'm diving into my recovery with the diet mentality. I just kind of figured that out like a few months ago. I was like, oh, I'm going after my recovery. I'm going after the emotional sobriety work because I don't want to feel any pain. I want my life to be perfect. Well, that's, that's not realistic, right? And emotional sobriety is about accepting reality. In fact, I'm going to jump into emotional sobriety right here. What is emotional sobriety? Um, thought management, feeling our feelings, 
accepting reality the way it is, this is emotional sobriety, okay? Um, we just really want to control our world. We have this, I'm gonna scooch you guys over again. Um, we have this cycle that we go into. And this is this this brings us a lot of pain. Life happens up at the top, and we have some sort of addictive thinking around it. Like um, someone, you know, is a little short with me talking to me, and I and I immediately in my mind I have this, oh, I'm rejected. I'm not good enough, and I so I have this thought that's addictive, and then that brings a lot of painful emotions. Like, oh, I'm, you know, like, I just feel scared. I feel sad, you know, because I think I'm rejected. And that gives me this urge to like either withdraw socially or maybe people please and like go help, you know, like make sure that person likes me and control how that person feels about me. And so then I start doing these actions of like um, showing up dishonestly with people. Like I want someone to like me so badly that I show up dishonestly. And because of that, there's a reaction from that other person and they might not like, they might not like me showing up dishonestly, or they might, um, you know, expect more of me or the boundaries are gone. And there's all kinds of reactions, but this thing just spins out of control and it's very painful. This is the heart of our pain. This is why we eat. Okay. This is what we've got to deal with. Um, at shift, we really, use the 12 steps as um, part of our recovery model. So we lean on, we don't lean on, we plug, we help people plug into the 12 step fellowships. 12 step fellowships are a humongous gift to the world. I have been so incredibly grateful. This is a community of support where we are all recovering together. We can do outreach calls we can do serve we can have pe people serve us being sponsors there's meetings um the tools of the program i'm talking about are just the wisdom of everyone that everyone has gathered together over over time that is like uh you know prayer and meditation quiet time um phone calls to each other. We have literature that we read that's inspiring. We have our daily habits that we do and we hold each other accountable. So the 12 step fellowships are just a beautiful, um, beautiful gift to the world. And they've got some struggles too. Since it's addicts helping addicts, we're all sick people helping each other. Sometimes in the 12-step fellowships, there can be food plan issues. I don't know if you guys know, but we have so many food 12-step fellowships as opposed to like Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what they got. Well, now we've got OA, we've got FA, FAA, Gray Sheeters. I mean, there's just, there's, and there's so many kind of versions and branches of each one. And it it's because of that slippery slope. It's so hard to like balance, like, get people right in the right spot. So you can have too loose of food plans and you can have really restrictive food plans. And it's hard to kind of navigate that sometimes. And then you can have control issues too, because here we are, we're all addicts. And you'll have a sponsor who is serving you freely and they may have control issues. They might be too loose and want to people please. They might be too restrictive and want to control. So one thing we recommend at shift is that you know with professional support we can really help you navigate through these issues if you're thinking about getting into a 12-step fellowship and it's you seem you know you want to know which one does which and um just have some help it's it's hard to like we call it sponsor shopping like i want to find a sponsor who will let me do exactly what i want to do but i can that's not necessarily helpful right so it's tough to sponsor shop with an, with an addict brain that's trying to kind of get what it wants. So coaching, and I'll put a link to the coaching. This is another one of the links that I'll have at the end. Um, that can really help you navigate these. So we've got the 12-step fellowships, and we've also got 12-step work, okay? And it's interesting that sometimes people are in these 12-step fellowships, and they never actually do the 12 steps, 
All right. Um, the history of the 12 steps goes back to 1939 when, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous wrote the big book, the, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, these people experienced the higher power of their own understanding. All right. It, it's not, and nobody, when you come into 12 step work, nobody tells you what your higher, how to define your higher power. It's, it's all just asking us to really put down all of our preconceived notions and just experience what is there, what we experience. Um, so it's, it's very open and 12 step. the 12 steps are literally 12 steps. There are 12 things that you do. And they are worked in 12-step study groups, AWOLs, which are stand for a way of life, and all kinds of different types of fellowships. Um, sometimes the 12 steps are, are watered down in some of these 12-step fellowships. And sometimes they're kind of added to or beefed up. Shift walks people through the 12 steps with the original recipe from the big book. And we are very passionate about the message and we use it from a therapeutic perspective. So this is a huge framework piece for our recovery. And many people are like, oh, I don't want to get involved with the 12 steps. I don't want to, you know, I don't have the idea of a higher power that kind of freaks me out. There's a whole chapter in the big book called We Agnostics, and it's written just for you. If that's you, check it out. Just be open the thing about the 12 step work is 12 step recovery has way better recovery numbers than any other modality that's out there. Over all these years, it just has so much better actual recovery. And that's what people said is was like, we experienced this. This is how the big book is written. It's like, we found that this works. We found that this works. We found that this doesn't work. It's the experience of the first people who'd who kind of came upon and developed this 12 steps with what works for addicts. And it still works today. It's amazing. Um, Shift also offers, and we, we're very much believe that professional therapy has a place in, in recovery. And many people are sick beyond the normal, you know, not the normal. There's some addicts have, this disease is, can be quite intense for some people. And so we do somatic process work and thought inquiry. And we're looking back at this cycle right here. We actually are teaching people how to interrupt this cycle and do a new cycle. So this, this is what we work on professionally at SHIFT. We teach people where to put put the pause in, and I don't. If you know your twelve step work, there's a pause when agitated in step ten, and this is where the pause is. It's right between that urge that we have, which is almost like a. If you think about it, it's just like a food craving. It's like, oh, I feel scared. What's I, I develop an urge to do something that's just very strong, just like, ooh, I and the urge might be, and I'd like to eat something now. And so between the urge and the action, there's a pause that we plug in there. And we really teach people to get present, to breathe, notice their feelings. And, and we don't just teach people, that we help people experience this. This is a big uh, bunch of the work that we do at the shift intensive, okay? So we check is this really true? This is the thought inquiry work. We really actually come down and like really experience that our thoughts have led us astray and that we need to get um, we need to get our thinking in line with reality. And then we can actually choose to do a different action. And so we develop an action plan where we have something different to do. It's almost like a, a food plan, actually. It's a, it's very similar to a food plan. Like I'm going to eat this much of this and this much of this. And then now when I'm in this and I pause and I recognize it, I know I have some actions I can take. And I just um, follow that plan and things come out differently. So um, let me stop sharing for a minute. And 
I will take some questions now if anyone has any, which let me get that off and let me see on the chat. If anyone wants to raise their hand, oh, I see on the chat someone was asking, was that a skunk? Yes, my pet skunk Iggy when I was little. Does it, uh, if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question or you can type it either way and I would be happy to answer. Let's see here. No questions, okay. Oh, Rosanna, I've got you with your hand raised. Can you unmute? There you go. So <clears throat> a couple things. I'll start with this one. Um, the codependency um, that you brought up and how it's a part of um, the addiction. Uh, and certainly I've found in my many years of going to OA and uh, I, I've gone to Al-Anon and um, the whole mixture. But I just wanted to, that my last experience of trying to find a professional to help me with my food addiction in this um, part of the country that I'm in, I went to somebody who primarily is a substance um, use uh, counselor. And uh, I met with her a few times, had a lot of problems getting with her because she had kept counseling appointments. And so we got off to a very strange start. And then mm -hmm. she told me after she talked to me a couple of sessions, she said, your problem isn't addiction, it's trauma. So, and she's an alcohol, she's a certified alcohol and drug counselor. Mm -hmm. So, she, and she had told me, oh, I'm so interested in food, food addiction. And I get this all the time because I've studied it a lot. And I've studied addiction for alcohol i've studied i've been in uh, all the training for alcohol and um drug um counseling so she said um you need um to do trauma therapy i can do that with you and then you'll just be able to eat um mm. you know mm. like a like you want it. you'll just be able to eat you know what the normal. american you'll go is. back to being a normal person right right and uh, I find that in my, in just my life in the environment, um, the subject of trauma and things like co that comes up and it's very, very challenging to me to hold my ground, I guess. So I've become very, it feels very isolating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because food is so in this in this country in this time there there probably aren't very many people left now who who don't have a problem with some of the ultra processed food that they're subsisting on because it's become more in, in my life i'm 68 in more more and more of the food that people people purchase is good it's going to cause problems for them um yeah. so i just wanted if you could address that like how to uh, right right that honestly that is why i am so passionate about getting this message out because there's so much confusion out there and it's so interesting like the two parts of the disease it's like people that come to serve us in this area will focus on one or the other but never both and if we don't deal with both of them, we spin right back into the cycle. And so it's just, it's just unbelievable to me that, I mean, this, that cycle that I taught you guys comes right out of the big book, 1939. Like this is what the big book taught. This is almost a hundred years old. And we're still trying to say, well, if you just work on your trauma and your, which is essentially the emotional barometer, right? Yes, the emotional barometer needs attention. And that doesn't make me a normal person. I have, I have, you know, my brain will release more dopamine 
than the average person's brain, like 10 times more dopamine, or I actually, I don't know what the multiple is, but it's a lot more dopamine than the normal person's brain. I'm not a normal person. I have a condition, I have a physical condition. And as long as I can just be content with that and just stick to, you know, a no flour, no sugar plan. And I see that there's a question of what, what plan does, what food plan does shift, shift use? There's multiple, multiple food plans that work. That whole slippery slope thing where I had the avocado on the outside, plenty of food plans include avocados. There's so many different ways, but what you need, what, what we need is a guardrail around our food. It doesn't matter if the avocado is outside or inside. Bananas could be outside or inside. Coffee could be outside or inside. Well, some people are actually physiologically triggered by coffee. So what we need is a guardrail. And it doesn't really matter where that is, as long as it's not too restrictive and we're actually in, in a lot of hunger because that would be a problem, right? So there's a, there's a balancing spot and there's a lot of food plans that work and there's a lot of good ones out there. And there's a lot of confusion about this one's right and this one's wrong. And, um, and there's a lot of nutritionists out there giving great advice that works for a nutritional level. But when we are food addicts, we have to put addiction above nutrition. Okay, we just have to, because, you know, it, it kind of makes sense anyways, is like, how nutritious can I be while I'm binging, I need to stop the binging, right? And so that needs to be a top priority within my food plan, I can do some nutritional choices. But that's not my first priority. That's not my first priority. Um, all right. Did I answer your question well enough, Rachel? It's Rosanna. Oh, um, Rosanna, I'm sorry. It, you moved. I, I guess um, the little piece that um, I, I, you know, it's, I, and you hear this in 12 step meetings too. Um, I just think that there is a, a level of, and maybe this is what um, probably is what, what Shift and other programs try to, um, assist with because I think it's a guardrail I think it's a wheelchair I think it's I, I, you know there are a lot of metaphors that I use but I think um, in the process of trying to get where you are where where a lot of people get to there's this there's this period that you do, I I'll speak for myself I don't have um, the uh, what's I don't I don't know it's like the conviction to to not I don't stand up to these people or something <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that's a, mm -hmm. like because I, it's got to come from me if if I'm going to be wishy-washy well you know maybe you're right maybe on Thanksgiving I can eat whatever everybody else eats or something like that but mm -hmm. it's getting to that place um while still living in the world you know that right uh, right is is uh because people um well i'll give you an example that just happened yesterday i went for a really long walk with somebody it was really lovely um she's not an addict as far as i know but she has two boys who are and they're in recovery um and uh she was essentially and and she's and in so many ways she was being supportive and I think she gets some of it but then at the, at the end of the day and this happens with other people too like well okay let's go get a treat because we just went for this really long walk and so she she was really pushing me at least getting like a diet soda and I'm like uh-uh <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and, and so could. there's yeah so, so there's this there's this, um, uh, like I want a, a, a shield or a, you know, a bulletproof vest or something that mm -hmm. will um, mm -hmm. protect me while I, on the, on, the t on the times that I feel so weak and so much like I do want to give in. Yeah. And this is when the community, this is when outreach and community and meetings um, really carries us through 
because on our own, we do get weak and shaky and, um, you know, and we feel like, and, and it's, I think it's uh, a very, um, you know, natural thing for us to need, need to kind of belong to the herd and the social herd. So, you know, I have my own herd and it's not the normal people of the world. I have my own community. I have my own outreach calls. I have people, that's one, such a beautiful thing about the 12 step world. I have people I can call um, day and night and I can be standing in the grocery line and call them. I can, you know, I can call them in a puddle of tears and, you know, they know me and they're with me. And so I have people, so I'm not alone. And yes, I totally hear you, Rosanna. Like people just do not get it. And they just want you to, can't you just have one? And it's so hard to explain. So hard to explain. Um, Rachel, you've got your hand up. Hi. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is very helpful. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on, you know, it's hard because my brain keeps coming up with more things to ask. Um, I've definitely tried variety of the food 12 step programs mm -hmm. and completely agree in terms of, you know, the sort of the one-offs and some of them are for me became too lenient <clears throat> or a lot of relapse um, mm -hmm. from me um, to like so restrictive that it feels punishing um, <clears throat> because it's like I'm struggling a bit with feeling like I can ask, um, well, why can't you have this? You know, and I get the like, well, this is how it's been done. Like, this is just, there's no real medical basis for it. There's no nutritional basis. It's just, and when I talk about what I'm asking, like, well, you can't mix your vegetables. Like, it mm -hmm. just feels so restrictive mm -hmm. that I find myself wanting to be in a 12 step program and being honest, but also putting away the baseball bat. And I'm like, I'm not going to beat myself up because I had a pear instead of an apple, but my plants that I, I told her I was having an apple. Like I just really struggle yeah, okay. with some okay. of the, the basis yeah. of, of what other addicts, like you said, are putting people through. Right. And I, I have to say that a lot of those things are come to by experience, just like big book people had experience of this is what works, these 12 step works. And a lot of these rules of like, oh, you said you're committing an apple and you changed it to a pear, you know, and, and that matters sometimes. And, and, you know, finding a sponsor, a sponsors are giving us what worked for them. And that's yeah. what we get, right? And so, you know, and the, the problem is so many people have different degrees of this disease right so when you come to some of the um, rooms where things are a little bit looser people don't actually have recovery and so yeah. you can't get anywhere with them um and then you get these people that are like eh, it's nice and narrow and i would just have to say if you're struggling and you're not contented you're not in food freedom you're not um contentedly sober it feels so squishy, these rules. Okay. And, and yet just surrendering to them. The one ingredient, I didn't, I forgot to say this on the slippery slope. The one ingredient that we need in our food plan that seems to really make a difference is surrender. We don't need not being able to mix vegetables. We don't need an avocado or not an avocado. Corn is a vegetable, corn is a grain. Yeah. This is, you know, there's a billion <laughs> rules. What we need is surrender. So it almost feels like every sponsor needs to have some sort of dumb rule that I don't want to do because yeah. I need that chance to surrender. And I, I do, it. yeah, and I do have to say, you know, with switch, switching things, when I work with my sponsees, it's like, but why are you switching it? Because our disease can really play a part in, well, I said I was going to have an apple, but that looks better. That's our disease, getting a little window in. And and there's something about just doing what we committed that gives okay. us this freedom. And so I do get the whole, you know, you said you were going to eat this, so eat it. That way our brains 
are not ever making decisions about what to eat within the day. And I also think that when you're beginning, you need a little more structure. And then as you get into recovery, things may change. You know, you, you won't have the same rules forever. You won't have the same sponsor forever. And, but the surrender piece needs to be there. So I would just encourage you to just surrender unless it's, you know, some you know something that's like you're going anorexic and not mm. there's a medical reason that you need to change your food plan but for many of us it feels too restrictive and that's because we want to have our way our addiction just wants room to operate and, and oh, gotcha. just like something to just like what do you really need that freedom mm-hmm. you know, is it really that hard to eat only one vegetable people do it and they get recovery is it worth it, you know, or would you rather fight for that mix of vegetables? That sounds like a spot that surrender is just kind of the perfect thing for. And well, it's I, think, I think that the, the, my concern is what feels so rigid is the feeling of like, oops, I had a pair. I'm going to the store to get the ice cream. Mm. Like I effed up, forget it. Like, this is so hard. You know, I'm being mm-hmm. so hard on myself for a good choice, I'm going to CVS to the candy aisle. And that's my concern. And and there we're diving into the emotional sobriety now. You see what I'm saying? See how that's like, that's your thinking that takes us off track. So it's interesting. We, we do, we take ourselves right down with our thinking and it's like, Oh, if you had, if your sponsor said no on this pair or whatever, what does that mean? And like, really check your thinking around that. Like, you know, cause many of us are like, oh, I'm a bad person. It's worthless. I can't, I'm not getting anywhere. And like, those things are not true. And then we take actions based on those false thinkings. And that's the emotional sobriety piece. Okay. So I'm glad you yeah. brought that up. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Wanda? Hi there. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. I'm really heartened to learn that the organization that you are with uses the 12 steps of AA. Mm -hmm. Um, I have been familiar with 12 step programs since I was a young adult 40 years ago. Um, when I got involved with a, uh, alcohol and drug addict and um over time when I would look at different you know I got involved with Al-Anon I got involved with OA multiple times over the years and it just their their written materials and stuff just didn't sit well with me it was like there's too much fluff there's there's you know the Sticking with AA, the big book, Mm. it's straightforward. Um, There's not a lot of wiggle room, which is actually a great thing. Um, But is it appropriate for me to ask a question about one of the programs you're currently offering? Uh, You know, I actually have a few more slides to show. I just paused for questions and I I am going to talk about them. So why don't you hold it till the end and I might answer your question on the way out. Okay, that'll be great. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, I'll jump back into these slides and there's just a few more to to show. And then I do see some questions over in the comments that I'll get to. So let's see if I can get back to where I left off. Are you seeing it? Okay. All right. So moving on. I can't get it going. There we go. So this is a little story I like to tell. Um, Our path. We're, We're actually inviting you to join us on our path. Okay. And when I talk about that, I'm, this is actually a mountain in Colorado that I've climbed. It's called Mount Uncompahgre. And the path that leads up to this mountain looks like this. Um, it's a 14er big deal. And, you know, we have this gigantic switchback. That's like, I don't know, a mile long. And when I was a young 
uh, kid, I was like 15, we were climbing with my parents. And, and I, when we were right about here, if you can see my mouse on there, um, I we could see the trail leading off to the left there. And I was like, well, why are we going to do that? We could just go the short way right here, you know. And my parents in their wisdom, this is what it looked like a little closer up. My parents in their wisdom were like, yeah, go for it, you know, and they they continued off on, on the trail. And me and my cousin uh, started scrambling up this slope. Yeah, no, we did not beat them. They went all the way down and came, they passed us by. And, you know, it was the road was rough. There was loose rocks. There was a little stream. There was, you know, it was scrambly. It was exhausting. It was not very easy at all. It was a rough, rough road. And this is what the path actually looks like up there if, if we would have stayed on the path. It's a well-worn path. So the idea is this, is I'm, a, I'm inviting you to a well-worn path where there's thousands of food addicts that have found recovery and they've found it, you know, like if you're in a wheelchair because you're a real serious addict, this is a steep, this is not the steep scramble up the side, find your own way kind of path. This is a path that's been working for people, thousands and thousands of people. And so we're just inviting you to do that. So it's kind of like a giant experiment. Okay. And this is the, and I was a science teacher before. So we have a hypothesis. If you follow direction, these directions thoroughly, you'll have the same result that thousands of food addicts around the world have had. It's just a path and it's well-worn. There's a line from the big book. It's one of my favorites. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path, okay? Finding your own way is kind of like um, you get cancer, and I had cancer, so I can say this. You get cancer and you're like, oh, I'll figure out how to cure myself. Really? They have professionals. There's doctors. You would want to get the help from people that know what they're doing. This is what I'm talking about. It's so different with food addiction. We feel like we've got to find our own way. We don't. We have a path laid out for us. We can just follow it. That's such a novel idea for us addicts. We think we can figure it out. No, we really can just follow this path. And it's a different thing. It's not a diet. It's not, you know, it's not a, anything that you're creating. It's just surrendering and following a path. So the, here's where I was going to talk about the program. So the next step with, with shift, if you, if you don't have a food, and I know so I saw in the comments someone asking for shifts food plan. If you don't have a food plan that's weighed and measured and um, uh, trigger substance free, this is a good way to get one. It's it's we're starting November 26th. It's self-paced, it's online. Amanda has made all these great videos guiding us gently down this path with the food plan. And we're gonna do online coaching calls along with it. It's gonna be me on a Thursday night. Um, and it will be recorded, so it's not required that you go. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. It's like you 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 can do stuff on your own. And you can have some live Q&A if you want with me to get some coaching. Um, it's going to have the community and connection of the Shift community. And it is on sale right now for $249, down from $699, I think is what it was. So it's starting November 26th with, with a kickoff call. You can register for it now. And... Um, get started because they have a prep module where you can, you know, just make sure you have the things you need to get started. So that's one thing you can do. Um, we also do uh, 30 minute consults. If you want to talk to me, I, I do most of the consults. Um, we have shift strong meetings that you are, and, and I'll put all these links in the chat in just a minute. I just can't do all the things at the same time. Um, the Yale food addiction scale, coaching, counseling, meditation classes. These are all things that SHIFT does in addition to the intensive, which I'm gonna actually stop sharing and talk about that. Um, we just wrapped up 
and intensive here. I'm in Florida. Um, 12 people in a house. We pop up every, um, we're doing like six intensives a year. So we rent a house and we have people come and the, the, it's called the intensive for a reason. If you want to get started in the deeper emotional sobriety work, this is where we really get into it. The food freedom class will get you started on the physical piece. And it, but it is just only a beginning. If you if you just think you're just doing a diet, you're not, it's not, you know, eventually you're gonna fall back into it. So the intensives are like, you know, we feed you abstinent food there. And then literally you're spending eight hours a day in groups doing this deeper, this somatic processing, this thought inquiry, really learning how to interrupt that cycle that goes on in our head that just causes so much pain in here. And um, and really just, and, and all within the frame of, framework of the 12 steps by the time. So our intensives are 12 week programs. They're one week intense. And then they follow with 11 weeks of aftercare. And by the time you're done, you've worked the entire 12 steps from the original big book with support. And you'll have a sponsor and community through shift. And it's just the whole, you know, it's the full package of what people need. So that is what shift does. We do them both in person and online. We used to just do them in person, but then COVID hit and it was like, well, we can't do in person, so might as well try it online. Didn't think it would work. It totally worked. It's the same as being in person. Like you're just sitting here looking at a computer for eight hours a day or more or longer. Um, by the time you're done with these intensives, these 12 week programs, you've had over a hundred hours of time with coaches, counselors, groups. It's really, um, it's what we need. You know, we're sick and we need help. It's what we need. And a lot of people think <clears throat> it's super expensive to go to an intensive. We do payment plans. We really can break it down. We really want to help people. And honestly, you guys, if you think about how much money you spend on binge foods and how much of your life you're just wasting away in and out of the food, it's worth it. You're worth it. Take the time to take care of yourself. It really is worth it. Um, I am looking at the questions right now on the side here. I don't know. Al, I'm reading your question. I've been in relapse for over 10 years. I'm not sure even with my two years and three years of abstinence, was it abstinence or was it the diet mentality? Yeah, I'm up and down, in and out. I'm never willing to fully surrender. I have over 34 years with three other addictions. Ask my higher power every day to help me to become willing. I guess I still think I can do this on my own and I know better. I know the answer, but I'm not willing to do it. Oh, Al, my heart goes out to you. Um, yeah, this is such a tricky disease. It really is. And, you know, Phil Wardell, who was the uh, the founder of, of Shift, um, had some famous lines, um, just surrender to the level of support that you need. That's might be the answer. I mean, yeah, there's a lot. Amanda teaches too, like she got off of drugs and alcohol, but was she really sober because she was still in the food? She does not consider that sober. Um, she just turned from drugs and alcohol to food. And getting sober, getting to the heart of addiction is a big it's a, it's tough and it needs specialized treatment. And if you need professional treatment, it's, it's very hard. Like, um, it's, uh, Roseanne, I think was talking about that. It's very hard to find treatment that is going to take care of the full part of the disease, both the physical abstinence and the emotional sobriety. It's tough. Um, I mean, there's plenty for drugs and alcohol, but not for food. There's not a lot for food. So um, we are here though. That's why we're here. That's why we're passionate about doing this. Um, are there any other questions out there? Because I, that is the end of my slides now. So I welcome questions, comments. I think I answered all the questions on the side. Rachel, you still have your hand up, but I think you just didn't. 
put it down. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Oh, there is a question here about what would an action plan look like for an urge. Oh boy. And when I, it's for me, it's been so interesting because um, I first got the physical sobriety, right? I I'm I go to a different 12 step, I go to one of the 12 step groups and I get the physical recovery. And then I, you know, I work the steps and I'm like, oh, wow, lots of transformation through working the steps. And still I spin off in my mind and these things and I, that, you know, it's really called a mental binge or an emotional binge and it's very painful. And when I started, I finished my training for food addiction counseling and I started talking to Amanda uh, about working at shift, I was on the hunt for emotional sobriety. And, I, you know, I work a different 12 step program that deals more with emotions and um, on the hunt for emotional sobriety. And I have been so blessed to work here because I get to play clients sometimes. Um, and I have just, I took the, we just finished a class, a course called emotional sobriety that Amanda taught and, um, Amanda and Gina and yeah, it was life altering. I have these cards now. Um, I have three of them, different patterns that I go into. So for me, um, one of them is perfection mode. I call it perfection mode. I also see it as dishonest and I can recognize I'm in it now because I've really, I took some time through this course to really lay it out. I can see how it feels in my brain. I get scared um, and I start rationalizing because it's not okay with me that I've made a mistake. And the thinking is that I'm gonna be rejected because of this mistake that I don't belong anywhere. It's very painful. And so now I know that when I see that urge coming up of like, I'm going to rationalize, I'm going to lie, I'm going to cover this mistake that I've made, I'm going to keep obsessing about this mistake, I can actually in those moments, take a deep breath and have a different action plan where I can, uh, you know, make a phone call that, and talk about it. But I have to be careful there because sometimes I can obsess about it while I'm talking about it so I can share it without a victim mentality. Um, we can do physical things like, like literally just breathing and just feeling, sitting in the emotion that I'm trying to avoid, just sitting it and feeling this is like a relax into your body kind of exercise. Humming can help. I haven't tried the humming very much yet. And, and this is where I'm at with my, with my healing is I'm right at this point where I'm like super aware that I'm going into the pattern. And now I have a choice and I can do something different. And I'm just on the edge of working out because I just finished this class like a month ago or something. So I'm enjoying the classes too at Shift. Um, I do a lot of the work for Shift for social media and the, some coaching, but um, I get to sometimes go to an intensive or take a course that um, Amanda's teaching. And it's, yeah. I'm in a good spot, people. I'm loving it. Soaking up all this great stuff here at Shift. So um, hopefully that was a good enough answer for that one. Any other questions? It's been great having you guys. And I certainly hope that um, this information has been helpful, really helpful. I just, oh. It breaks my heart when I hear people's stories where they're just getting, you know, one side or other of the treatment, but they're not getting both. They're just not quite putting it together. And it's not, it just doesn't work when you don't put it together. So that is my message and that well-worn path. And we are here. People shift is here for your food addiction, emotional sobriety, recovery. Like that's what we do. So Stay in touch with us. I, oh, I, you know, I was supposed to drop all of these. Um, hang on. Let me escape from this. I have to get all of these links. I'll give you a minute to. Um, I think I can just copy this and drop it into the chat. But I will, there will be a, um, where is my chat? Oh, geez. Here we go. 
Let's see. Oh, everyone. Send. Okay. There we go. You guys got that in the chat? You can copy and paste those. I'll leave those up for a minute. Um, and if you're watching the recording, I will put all of these in the details. And all of you who are on here um, will also get a recording link for this recording that you, you've just participated in. And you can, um, you'll be able to get these again on that recording link as well. It'll just be on YouTube and you can look down in the description and you'll find all of these links. So thanks everyone. Any last questions? All righty. Well, I hope you guys have a great Saturday afternoon. It was great talking to you and uh, we will see you soon, hopefully. Stay in touch. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.